Good morning, everybody. Chad Stevens, Interventional Pain Management uh, down in Fort Worth, Texas. So glad to be up in the, the cool, cold, rainy Seattle with all our friends here. So it's my first time here. I'm lucky to be invited to come and uh, participate with this. So the first thing we're going to learn this morning, we're going to start right off the bat with something that I do every week, and I've been doing this for about 25 years. So this is something that every week I see patients in the practice that clearly have a need that could be met by treating them with radiofrequency ablation. So when it comes to radiofrequency ablation, you have to kind of choose your tool. And there are tools that are uh, better than others for various reasons. The one I'm using today is uh, called the Avnos Cooley tool. This is a radiofrequency ablation tool. And what I like about this is that you'll see there's a little silver end down here. So most standard RF like go from a distal tip and they come more proximal with their lesion. What I like about this one is that it comes in a diamond. And so basically you put this down in any angle. It's called angle independence. And you can come down and you get to the space. You always want to be right where the transverse process and the superior articular process take off or coalesce with each other. But you can come in at any angle, which is nice when you have a complex anatomy or if you want to just be able to place this quickly. But what is, so it's got that angle independence for one thing, but it also projects distally. So because this projects distally beyond the tip, you're able to get about 30% beyond this tip, which gives you a larger lesion size. So the name of the game in radiofrequency ablation is trying to hit the target you're shooting for, which are these little small little spaghetti noodles called medial branches, but not just hit them, but have an effective radiofrequency neurotomy of them so the patient will get good lasting relief. So without any further uh, time I'll waste there, let's go ahead and come in and take a picture. You always want to start out with something you can see. Um, we're going to look for an oblique image. Tom, if you could bring this towards you a little bit. Yeah, and so um, even a little bit more towards you, sir. And I'm going to just place one of these needles here. Give myself a little bit more working room. Picture, please. So right there, you'll see basically that if I go right down, I always say I'm going to try to put this on the eye of the Scotty dog. And we all know the Scotty dog. You can see just uh, to the left and upper is the superarticular process. And going to the right is the transverse process. So basically, I'm just going to come right down in a perpendicular fashion, which is really nice with this image, please. So I'm going a little bit too far lateral. I'm just gonna angle just a little bit more down the tube. Image, please. And I'm gonna walk this down until I get down to the bone. Okay, let's see. Image, please. Should be getting pretty close to bone right now. And there's bone right there. Image, please. So I wanted to hit right at the Scotty Dog's eye, and I believe we did. Again, the nice thing about this is you don't have to come in at um, in a, like a perpendicular, like, well, basically you have to lay a typical standard needle right in that groove and it can make it a little bit difficult to approach, but you saw how easy and direct this can go in. So they have a couple of different noodle, uh, needles at Avanos. The, basically, this is the one that's been around for a long time and there's a lot of advantages like I've mentioned, bigger lesion size, which correlates with a longer uh, result for the patient. They'll have longer pain relief, which is the goal. And then it also has this nice little tool here where you can just, instead of having to mess around with taking an, in and out the stylet, you can just add your local as you put, after you've put the, uh, the probe all the way in. So basically you place, place this in, get down to the bone, back it off just a little bit because remember I said it has a distal projection. So what you do then is you come to your probe and your probe attaches to the generator. And all you have to do here is just take this and click it on here. And again, I, I wanna be just right off the bone. Image one more time, please, Tom. And that looks like money. So when you have that, then I'll usually add, um, we'll do sensory and motor testing if the patient's awake. If the patient's asleep, we'll just do sensory testing. Or motor testing, excuse me. And once we have a good idea that we have maybe a little multifidus that's stimulated, but no distal um, stimulation in the lower extremity, then we go ahead and um, usually do a little bit of local anesthetic and do our lesion. In particular, this lesion is for two and a half minutes. And so typically I'll place all of my needles on the side I'm working on um, and then lesion them all at the same time. So this is something that I do when I'm at the hospital setting. If I want a little bit more cost-effective option, 
Um, this is the, the Trident, which is a newer tool that Avanos has acquired. It's a little bit different to drive because it's got more of like a beveled drive. But what you'll see is, if you can see a tip there, this one is going to be more of a standard drive. It's, it's going to have the, um, the bevel, so you're going to be able to directionality drive it instead of a diamond. But you're still going to be able to go down in this perpendicular fashion, just like I did on the other level. So I'll just show the difference here, image there. And you'll see that you can still see it pretty well on there. The difference here is, if we can come right back to this one more time, I should have showed you this before. But what happens is once you get into the space, you just turn this little gray knob. I don't know if you can see those little tines open up there. Those little tines open up and make kind of a bell-shaped lesion. So you're going to get a, a better lesion size than standard RF, but um, it's, it's, you know, like I say, a more cost-effective way of doing this. So let's look at that picture one more time, please, sir. One more time. Thank you, Tom. I'm just going to walk this down. Again, it's a very easy drive down to the bone image there. The, the directionality factor is, is nice because you can really change it easy. I'm going to work it back. Image there. Now I'm just walking back. I have to sometimes back up just a little bit. Image there. And I want to walk it more up to the nose. Picture. We're getting there. You can see it's a little bit different drive. This is a little bit less stout. Um, um, the probe is made a little bit less stout material. Again, you have this ability to do some localizing after it's already in there. So we get this where we want it. And then we open up the tines. Image, please. Kind of see the tines opening up there. So um, let's go ahead and go to a true, so let's, let's go back a step. What I always do is I want to see three different images to be sure of my depth and where uh, that I'm in a safe place. Everything we're doing today, we're going to be showing you how to do things reproducibly, safe, and efficaciously. So um, I always start in this oblique image, and I go to a lateral image. The goal in the lateral image is to obviously make sure you're remote from the foramen, but also to make sure you're close to the facet, because we know that the medial branch leaves right about where the Scotty dog's eye is, and it walks its way up into that facet. So if I lesion, at this place where I am, right, that confluence between the superarticular process and the transverse process, I should have an effective treatment. So we're going to look at our lateral view next. Whenever you think we've got enough does the table height, I need to go up a little bit, probably a little bit up with the table. These cadavers are not quite Texas sized, but um, we'll, we'll make it work. I'm sure Doug will make some joke about Oklahoma skinny later, so I wanted to beat him to the punch and talk about Texas size. Always great to have a great team around you because they're the important people here. We're just doing the, the driving. We're the, the robots. So you can see, especially the bottom one is, is laying right there on that facet joint itself. And then you can see the top one, the, the, the Kuleaf one. Remember we talked about how we want to be just a little bit behind the facet. If you could keep the picture on the, on the lateral fluoroscopic image, there you go. You can see that it's a little bit behind the facet, and I'm okay with that because, again, the projection of 30% you know, or so distal beyond that tip is acceptable. But, and you can see the foramen here. We're way remote from anything scary. Remember we've done, um, we're going to get all these placed in the motor tests and if the patient's awake, do sensory testing. But this looks pretty good. So then I go to a straight AP picture. Again, three images to see that I'm in the right place and that I'm not going to harm my patient. We always set out to make our patients better. And just by taking a few precautions by using the right tools and knowing the tools you're using, it decreases the risk substantially. So I'll show you this one more time. And on the AP image, if you could move it over towards you maybe, Tom, so I could see it just a little better. It's always good to be able to see. Now, Tom needs to be able to see it for sure, too. But ideally, we want to be, yeah, I mean, pretty close to where we are. You can see the tines are coming out. And um, we want to be maybe a touch closer to where the superarticular process and the transverse process come, intact, or come in contact with each other. But this looks pretty good. So um, back to just kind of the options. We talked a little bit about the benefits of, of the cooled needle. This has the, the probe, it has a, um, a uh, water going in and out of this, which is effectively going to make our lesion size bigger. Um, somewhere around, what, what would you say? 10 to 12 millimeters. This trident is going to make it close to 10, 
about 10 millimeters as well. But remember, this is a disposable unit, so mostly done in surgical hospitals from my, in my standpoint. And then the surgery center option is the Trident. And then they also have one that if you want to have kind of a reusable one and not a disposable one, you can just buy these separate, which are just the actual introducer, and then you can use these probes reproducibly and they can be autoclaved. So I think that gives you kind of the the three-prong approach that um, the Avanos products give you allow really any setting, because a lot of pain doctors are starting to work more out of their surgery centers, or a lot of people are even working out of their office. And so you want to make sure that it all works for you, that you have a tool that you can trust, you understand the, the benefits and the downfalls of each tool, you want to give patients adequate expectations. Typically, the patients are going to feel better, but it may take a few weeks for them to feel better, and it will last a variable amount of time. Sometimes it will last somewhere in the neighborhood of six months, sometimes it lasts up to two years. So you wanna kind of give the patients an adequate expectation so they can trust you and they know that if something does come back again, that you've given them adequate you know, information for what they can expect on the line. So uh, with that, um, these are the, the, you know, the tools I wanted to present this morning. I'll go ahead and open this up for questions and answers as far as any, anything to do with radiofrequency ablation or with these uh, particular tools um, you know, that we talked about today. So anybody interested, Doug? Very good. Questions or comments? So, Dr. Stevens, could you tell us the difference? You mentioned the uh, volume of the lesion. So it's, it's uh, uh, larger with these uh, multi-tined or cool radiofrequency ablation. Cool. Could you compare this to uh, standard RF, for example? I believe, that, well, standard RF has a lot of variability because you basically have to look and see what the active tip size is and each, each device can be different. And there's, there's um, different uh, options out there with some that have like a tined, uh, like a two-tined approach that you then turn around and you can get a, a good size lesion by burning one way and flipping around and burning the other way. But I would say that the standard RF is, is more like a five mil, uh, millimeter burn versus a 10 to 12. And so, um, and again, if you do a dissection, and I know this is a very scientific talk, you will see that there's a lot of variability of these medial branches. And especially if you come back a couple years down the road and do it again, there's even more variability because they have figured out a way to grow back and cause the patient pain in the facet joint again. So the bigger the lesion, I think the better chance you have of getting those nerves. Right. And then uh, just one fairly straightforward question. Who is a candidate for a lumbar radiofrequency rhizotomy? It's a great question. So when you're, when you're talking to your patients about their presenting complaints, you always want to kind of separate things that are axial back pain and things that are ridiculous. And when I'm thinking about my patient that's ideal for a, a RFA of the lumbar spine, it's somebody that comes in and has kind of a, a presentation, various, various age, but they have a presentation where they talk about axial back pain mostly, very little radiculopathy, maybe a little bit of achiness in their hip or their groin or something, but for the most part, just axial back pain. And they're gonna talk about how whenever they're standing and extending backward, that increases their pain. Extension with rotation either way is going to make those facets grind against each one another and cause additional pain. And so those patients are gonna be the best. And then when they lean forward, if you look at a cadaver even, and you take the cadaver and you flex it forward, what you'll notice is the facet joints separate from one another. So when they lean forward, they should have improvement. Now, it is a little differentiating, um, differentiating spinal stenosis symptoms from this. It's a little bit difficult because those are similar findings, but obviously they have different presentations clinically and then radiographically. So I don't rely as much on the imaging studies, Doug, on these as I do for other procedures, such as when I'm looking for spinal stenosis. But what I'm really looking at is the patient's presentation. They're, you gotta actually physically touch the patient, do an exam on them, and then um, listening to the fact that most of their pain is axial is kind of where I start. Right, exactly. Um, and then one, one final question for you. Sure. Uh, why would you use uh, a higher volume lesion rather than a lower volume lesion? I think it's the ease of access. I mean, there's a lot of fellows watching today, a lot of people that are, you know, haven't done a whole lot of RF. And, and I will tell you that, and somebody who has taught a lot of fellows, it can be kind of taxing and a little bit difficult to teach somebody to lay the probe in the exact position it needs to be right on that interface between the transverse process and the superarticular process I talked about. And so I think the ease of access and placement with the two tools I've shown you today is so much easier for somebody who's learning and, and is starting to try to go, okay, 
if I drive the bevel this way, it pushes it, you know, to the middle. If I drive this way, it pushes it lateral and stuff. With especially with the cooled probe, it's a diamond shape, so it just drives in right through the tissue very easily and goes right to the target. Right. And as you mentioned, for those of us who, with a lot of experience, we know that the nerve is variable, can, can be very variable sometimes, and this helps, uh, helps accomplish that goal. So one of the really good seminal articles on volume size, Leo Capral basically says the larger the lesion, the better the clinical outcomes, and that's kind of what we're after here. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Agreed. Uh, question? Um. Well, uh, do you come across post uh, ablative neuritis and what's your treatment? Do you hear that, Chad? The question is about post ablation neuritis. Yeah, it, it, as far as like with re doing this over and over and over, or how do I prevent it acutely when I do the procedure? Yeah, that the second one. Yeah. Okay, so a okay. lot of people will go ahead and um, add a little bit of steroid at the end of the procedure. Um, I have not ever employed that in my practice because. Um, typically, I'm trying to give patients as little steroid as I can because of the risk of changes with, you know, their diabetic blood sugar elevation and people that, you know, just the, just it's kind of a ride. If you've ever had steroid shots, it's a little bit of a ride. It gives you a little bit of a high for a few days, makes you a little bit, you know, feel a little bit on, like, on top of the world. But when it comes to this, some people go ahead and just inject their, with their local, they'll inject a little bit of dexamethasone or something at the end, right, to just kind of reduce that neuritis, that acute neuritis. Typically, with these lesions, again, I don't tell patients you're going to feel better the minute you walk out of here. I tell them you're going to probably have a few days of achiness, followed by not sure how it's gone, and then about three or four weeks down the road, you're going to feel a whole lot better. Maybe earlier. Sometimes they feel better right away. But if they don't, then at least you've kind of given them a playbook for what they can expect, and then they aren't calling you every, you know, every day going, hey, I'm still hurting here. What's the deal? And to give you another perspective, I do use steroids for post denervation neuritis. Um, you know, my post denervation neuritis is not common. It's somewhere in the range of about 1% to 5%. But to me, that's way too often. So I, I usually give steroids. I've had, knowingly, I've had one case of post denervation neuritis of the cervical spine in the last five years. So it goes from, you know, unusual to rare. Okay, let's, uh, I'm sorry. What is that? Also, you yeah. can also give the patient uh, gamepeptin neurontin as well uh, if you're having a post innovation neuritis. Yeah. It's been helpful as well. I see it that anywhere if it does happen, as again, it's quite rare, but uh, you know, even one or two weeks later, I'll find that can happen. Uh, I'll do a medrol dose pack uh, and uh, uh, some you know, 200 to 600 TIV of uh, neurontin. And the new, new sodium channel blocker is pretty good for that too, Jornavix. So you try Gene. Question. Yeah, uh, thank you for the great talk. Um, question about the uh, use of Trident probe versus the cool leaf in the cervical spine. Um, I do use the Avanos platform. I've moved to using the Tridents for the cervical spine primarily. Um, I'd like to hear your thoughts or opinions about that. Is that, that for me? Uh, yes. I, haven't, I haven't used it on cervicals yet. Um, I do about 90% of my radiofrequency ablation with the cooled probe because um, just, just personally, I recently changed practices. A lot of my patients have been with me for 15, 20 years, and they've gotten those two years of relief reproducibly from the RF ablations. And so I haven't even um, taken some of those patients and tried the Trident with them because they've already been used to getting relief. But with the people that I do at our surgery center, um, I've only used this on lumbar spine so far. So I don't have a, an end to discuss there, I'm sorry. Okay, all right, well, why don't we transition over to interspinous decompression space?